Welcome back to the Middle Eastern Economy Class Smackdown. Two weeks ago, Doha-based Qatar Airways took the stage and wowed with their professional service and comfortable seats. One week later, Emirates took the stage to show us just what they could do and left Dan seriously impressed. The bar has been set high by our two Gulf Airlines, but what about Istanbul's own Turkish Airlines? On the border between Europe and Asia, can Turkish Airlines deliver the best of both worlds and blow the competition away? Let's find out. Today's video is brought to you by M1 Finance, who are giving you $30 to start your investment journey. First and foremost, why is Turkish Airlines included in the SmackDown and why am I calling them a Middle Eastern airline? They're an interesting and unique case where they can be categorized as both a European airline and a Middle Eastern airline. However, if we look at their business model, it becomes clear that their model is more similar to airlines in the Gulf. Firstly, Turkish Airlines is basically useless for flying within Europe. Since going all the way to Istanbul doesn't make sense, so they don't compete with the likes of Lufthansa Group, IAG, or Air France KLM for that specific traffic. Even if you're connecting to Turkey, virtually every city you connect to is on the Asian side of Turkey, so for many people, you're looking to connect between North America and Europe, and Africa and Asia. And that's not to mention that the onboard experience, from the lemon mint to the candlelit dinners, is far more reminiscent of Middle Eastern carriers than European ones. So please, no comments saying, Dan, you should learn geography. It's 6 a.m. in Dubai on a scorching September morning. I leave my airport hotel and make the 15-minute journey to Terminal 1, where a Turkish Airlines Boeing 777-300ER is waiting to take me to Istanbul. The Turkish Airlines 777-300ER comes in two versions, and I was on a very rare one with just four rows of business class, and a whole lot of economy class spread out in an equally rare 333 configuration. Most airlines have chosen to re configure their 777s with four seats in the center since there's more than enough room, but Turkish has not. Well, that's it. We have a winner then. Turkish clearly has superior comfort. Well, not so fast. While you'd think that's the case, seat width is not all that counts. More on that shortly. Now when it comes to my preferred place to sit, the rows of two seats in back are strong contenders. My flight was quite full, so just like on Emirates, I played a game of musical chairs, changing seats several times via the Turkish Airlines app until 90 minutes before departure when I committed to 45k and hoped for the best. My game paid off and I got the row to myself. The 777 really is so beautiful, and Dubai has plenty of them on display. Boarding was listed to start at 6.35 a.m., a full hour before departure, but I knew the aircraft had only landed 30 minutes earlier and there was no chance boarding would start right away. Sure enough, we weren't allowed on board until 7 a.m., at which point all economy class passengers were boarded at once. After flying the 777 several times in the past week with the new normal 343 layout, seeing only three seats in the middle looked sort of bizarre. That means that only one third of all seats are middle seats on board, which is obviously great. On the other hand, the cabin colors look sort of tacky in my opinion, and the yellowish lighting didn't add to any sort of cozy ambiance. I made it to my seat 45k where I was greeted by one blanket per row? Hmm. There also weren't any pillows. Anyway, the seat itself has a video monitor which is decent and moderately responsive to touch. The entertainment selection is pretty good and there are no ads before the shows which is much appreciated. They had Bob's Burgers which kept me happy. The in-flight map, however, is in desperate need of an extreme home makeover. Underneath the screen is a classic remote with all the basic functions you need and underneath that is the tray table which folds out like this. The reason many airlines choose this tray table design is that that it's supposed to maximize space for other things, like room for the knees. On Turkish, unfortunately, it does not. The legroom here is rough. I mean really rough. This is before the seat reclines. When you recline, the seat cushion moves forward, pushing your legs even more into the seat in front of you. 
The recline is really good, but dare I say it's almost too good? It squashes your legs and look what happens to the seat behind you when you recline. Good luck even opening a laptop like this, let alone getting any work done. At least there's an adjustable headrest, am I right? The seat also has USB charging, which didn't seem to work, but the power outlets between the seats did, so I just charged my phone via my computer. I should also note the Turkish has a few different 777 seats, but this one seems to be the most common. During boarding, the flight attendants handed out a hygiene kit and headphones. Do you want me to start with the good or the bad? Let's start with the good. The hygiene kit is the best you'll get on any airline with two alcohol wipes, two masks, and hand sanitizer. Unfortunately, the masks are fragrant, which seems like a terrible way of torturing people if they don't like the scent. The headphones, sadly, are at the quality level where you wouldn't even bat an eye if your neighbors ran over them with a car. The sound is equivalent to your neighbors playing music from their 2014 Dell laptop on the loudest volume through a thin wall. Noise cancellation seems to have missed the flight or have been offloaded because she certainly did not bless us with her presence on this day. By the way, did I mention yet that Dubai is really hot this time of year? Luckily, we have air conditioning. Oh wait, there are no individual air vents. Okay, at least I can take a bath on board in my own sweat. So far, things don't seem super amazing, right? Don't get me wrong, apart from the legroom, none of my complaints are too serious. And all of these things are common in economy class on many other airlines as well. Soon enough, we took off and had the most scenic Dubai departure possible. This is a benefit of sitting far behind the wing because there's nothing to obstruct your outside views. As we climbed out, I checked the Wi-Fi on board, which they advertised as free for Turkish Miles and Smiles members. As a member, I was happy to see I could enjoy 10 megabytes of free data. More data can be purchased at the following prices. Data caps are not where it's at for me when it comes to in-flight Wi-Fi, and $25 for 500 megabytes is pretty expensive. But no time to dwell on that because in the blink of an eye, the crew was coming through the cabin with breakfast. There are no menus in economy class, but I think I overheard them say that they were serving porridge. I pre-ordered a vegan meal as always and got these delicious savory pastries along with fruit and cake. Turkish Airlines always has good catering and this was no exception, although the portion wasn't very large. I enjoyed my breakfast with some Pepsi and tea, both for a small energy kick after waking up at 3.30 a.m. European time where my body clock was at. One really sort of annoying and sketchy thing was that while the meal was being served, the flight attendants asked people to close their window blinds. When they served my meal, I asked why and they said everyone will sleep after breakfast. I said I don't intend to sleep and I'd like to look out over the stunning view of Iraq, because who would want to miss these views? But luckily, quite a few people seem to agree with me, so some window blinds were open here and there. The shady part of this is that it ties in perfectly with Turkish Airlines not having individual air vents. The oldest trick in the book when flight attendants don't want to work is to make everyone close their window blinds, and then they crank up the heat. What happens when they do that? You naturally get drowsy and want to sleep, which in turn means the crew has less work to do. This really is a classic trick, but I for one ain't falling for it. And sure enough, once the meal service was over, the crew was nowhere to be seen for almost two hours. The lavatories on board are pretty standard. Here's me. Hi, nice to meet you in this bathroom. Back at the seat, I continued to work for the remainder of the flight. About 90 minutes from Istanbul, the crew handed out water bottles, but that was the extent of any additional service. Speaking of service, do yourself a favor and hit that little red subscribe button to make sure you don't miss any of my videos and also get the chance to join me on a free flight in Qatar Airways Q Suite next year. Soon enough, we began our scenic approach into Istanbul's new airport. If you haven't been to Istanbul yet, it needs to shoot to the top of your bucket list. Turkey as a whole for that matter. It's one of the most friendly and beautiful places I've been. We touched down on schedule, arrived at our gate shortly thereafter, and then began the walking. Istanbul really said, walk. This is how far you have to walk just to get to transfer security, and then you have to do the same walk again to reach your gate. Luckily, I've learned how to speed walk through airports over the years, and I had one priority and one priority 
own me during my one hour connection, which was to get as much Turkish delight as possible. I also needed to pee and eat, but those were not nearly as important. By some miracle, I ultimately had time to do all three things and arrive at my gate before boarding had even started. There was my 737 MAX, my first MAX since the grounding. Oh boy. If you haven't seen my video called The Truth About Boeing, you might want to check it out because I learned some insane things that make me still not so comfortable with flying this jet. On the bright side, the 737 MAX cabin is nice. The seat is a definite upgrade over the 777, although the legroom still isn't great. Turkish Airlines seriously keeps their cabins at temperatures that make Dubai in August feel comfortable, so I was thrilled to see that I'd finally found a Turkish Airlines aircraft with individual air vents, but they didn't work during the entire flight. Oh, and this flight was full to the brim. Following takeoff where we enjoyed another scenic view of Turkey, this meal was served. This is seriously insanely good for a two hour flight in economy. I was especially impressed by both the sides which were genuinely delicious. As we approach Vienna, let me summarize my thoughts on Turkish Airlines. Let's start with the good. I like their catering in all cabins, although the portions are sort of small. The entertainment system is good, as is the recline if you're the one doing the reclining. The hygiene kit is excellent as well. Other than that, I'm really sorry to say there's not much I can say about Turkish Airlines that won't result in me getting all types of threats sent my way by Turkish Airlines fanboys. I'm generally a huge fan of the airline, but in all seriousness, Every other area than those I just mentioned were lacking, from the legroom to the Wi-Fi to the cabin temperature. The service didn't come close to reflecting the consistently welcoming and heartwarming interactions I had with almost every single person I met during my travels in Turkey. Overall, it is by far the best economy class you can fly between Europe and Turkey, but if you're connecting onward, prepare for a whole lot of walking in Istanbul and bring a USB fan to stay cool for God's sake. Wow, what a ride! Now all the players have shown us what they have to give, so only one thing remains. The ultimate smackdown coming in less than one week. So who will be crowned a winner? Will it be Emirates, Turkish Airlines, or Qatar Airways? Make sure you're subscribed so you can be the first to find out as the economy class smackdown continues. One thing I don't talk much about here, but you hear me mention sporadically on my channel Oscar and Dan, is that I'm actually into investing, and I spend a lot of time watching our favorite finance YouTubers, Graham Stephan, me Kevin, and at least half a dozen more. I was so excited when today's video sponsor M1 Finance reached out offering you guys $30 to get started on your investing journey. M1 is the finance super app that puts you in control of your wealth. Invest borrow, save, and spend your money how you want, with sophisticated automation tools to help you reach your financial goals more easily. Of course, they take no commission on trades so you can build wealth without worrying about high fees, which is one of the reasons why hundreds of thousands of investors are choosing to automate their finances with M1. By now, they manage almost $5 billion in assets. Just recently, M1 was awarded Investopedia's number one one rating for best app for sophisticated investors and best for low cost investing in 2021. So as I mentioned, for a limited time, you'll receive $30 when you sign up for an M1 account and invest $1,000 to start your journey toward building wealth in an easy and low fee manner. Use my link m1finance.com slash nonstopdan or visit the link at the top of the description. Terms and conditions apply.